Get the power to do more with storable software, more automating, more control, more revenue, more time back in your day. Storable helps operators do more with the most powerful technology in self-storage. Learn more at storable.com slash do more. My name is Matthew Beal, and I'm a product marketing manager here at Storable, and I've been your host for this four operator imperatives webinar series. I'll also be moderating today's panel for you guys. And before we get into today's content, I really wanted to kind of zoom out a little bit and just take a look at our webinar series at a glance. So two weeks ago, uh, we kicked off a new chapter of our four operator imperative series, uh, and we had a discussion on simplifying and automating your processes. And so we had a guest speaker on, Cameron Berrigan, uh, who discussed all of the resources that you guys have available to you to you know, leverage automation to unlock efficiency for you and your staff. Um, and we also discussed this concept of practical automation, which we'll be diving uh, a little bit further into today. And the idea is that you know, not everybody is either using no automation or are fully unmanned automated facilities, but the reality is most people are playing in a space somewhere in between, and we'll talk about what that looks like. And so today, we have a couple of fantastic guests for a roundtable discussion um, on that same topic. And so I'm going to be introducing them in just a moment. Um, but like I mentioned before, we're going to be exploring further that concept of practical automation, but really just simple, you know, these processes, automating processes, and kind of uh, how COVID has affected that as well today. But in two weeks, we're going to start our last chapter of the four operator imperatives. And so this is going to be on the concept of amplifying your operating revenue. And we spent a lot of time talking about how the industry, you know, has been really oversupplied a lot over the last three, three years and whether or not demand can kind of keep up with that. And it's forced us to kind of rethink about how we can make up for some of those losses in operating revenue. So it's been a lot of changes with COVID and we'll talk about how that kind of plays into it as well. But uh, in particular, we'll discuss kind of some revenue management tools and some various um, ancillary revenue streams that you can use to one, make up for your revenue, but also provide some valuable uh, experiences for your uh, tenants for your customers. So without further ado, I want to get into today's conversation now. And so like I mentioned before, we've got two guests. Uh, one is Brad Mensley. He's the managing director of 10 Federal Storage. Uh, they operate 53 locations across 12 states at approximately 2 million square feet. And we also have Katie Cohen, who's the regional director of Move It Storage. Um, and they operate 85 locations across six states at approximately 6 million square feet. So Brad, Katie, welcome. We're glad to have you guys here today. Glad to be here. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate the introduction. Very good. So uh, I want to kick off today's conversation with just kind of a, a very high-level brief summary. If you guys don't mind just kind of walking us through how both of your companies think about automation um, and, and kind of how you guys are utilizing that across your portfolio. And so, Katie, we'll start with you. Um, so I think about automation as something that we can leverage to just increase our efficiency day to day. Um, so, you know, the vast majority of our properties still have an on-site manager. That's still something, you know, business model that we're committed to. Um, but we want to free up their time as much as possible to, you know, to take care of the things that they don't have to do. I mean, that, that you know, they have to do that a computer cannot do. Um, so, you know, we look at automation as a way to kind of stretch our manager's capabilities further. Uh, and let them just really focus on, you know, their customers and the things that need the human touch. So, you know, we'll use automation for mailing services, text message services, email services, phone calls, um, you know, invoicing. I mean, all those kind of things to free up manager time so they're not sitting there stuffing envelopes or, you know, making 50 phone calls or, you know, writing out 50 emails or things like that. Um, so that's something that we're, you know, we're really committed to of just trying to make our managers jobs easier on on those routine tasks so they can focus on the non-routine things. Awesome, yeah, I love that. Brad, Brad, what about you? I know you've got a little bit of a different approach. Yeah, so 10 Federal, um, we've really focused on fully automating the facilities where there's truly nobody there uh, day to day. Uh, in fact, we're, I ran the calculation this morning, we're down to 0.53 storage employees uh, per property. And we're always trying to, we have two goals, and it's kind of a, you know, an ax, two axis goal. One is uh, continue to reduce that employee count per property, but at the same time, try to also improve that, that customer experience. And we want to increase always the area under that curve, if you will. But our facilities are, are wholly unmanned. You know, and we really try to drive those two goals using technology. Yeah, that's really interesting. And 
Katie, you brought up something that I actually kind of want to, uh, to spend a little bit of time talking about. Brad, you and I chatted about this a bit yesterday too, but you know, you, you, Katie, what you mentioned is there's kind of the, the human element still that is so important to this and that automation doesn't replace that. It just gives them an opportunity to focus on where they can provide those value on the human experience side, the human element side. And so, Brad, uh, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you guys still are, you know, introducing the human element into the storage rental experience, even though you don't necessarily have somebody on site. Yeah, so that's actually um, last year we, we have a large initiative where we surveyed all of our customers to really get their take on on our model. And it kind of came back one of two. It's very binary. They either loved it, they loved the simplicity and, and the uh, self-service capability, or they were very wary of it. And, and they expressed a real concern that it felt absentee and was this really a great place to leave their possessions. So what we've done to, to address that second group is um, we now have a second kiosk in our in every leasing office. Um, there's still a leasing office, even though um, no one's there. The, you come in and you start your journey with a large format kiosk. But there's a smaller one bolted to the wall, and we've spooled up a video call center segment of our, our call center. We have an audio call center, but now we also have a video call center. And then using... AI cameras, when somebody approaches one of our offices, it notifies our video call center that, you know, a customer is approaching, you know, this facility's office. And they initiate a video call directly into that office. So by the time somebody's in there, they're welcomed by a live person, you know, here from our Raleigh office. And, uh, you know, we don't so much try to handle the entire leasing workflow from there. We really try to welcome them, impress upon them that even though we are remote, we are still present and then send them on their journey using the large format kiosk to complete that leasing um, workflow. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And, and then, you know, that, that concept of practical automation we talked about, I mean, you guys are obviously very far along that curve. You know, you're very invested in this unmanned uh, experience. And I know the reason I think this question is so important, and Katie, I want to throw it to you kind of to finish uh, my thought here, it kind of want to hear what you say in response, but, um, is a lot of people are concerned that you lose the human element by investing so heavily in it. And I think it's a really, really great story to hear that you can preserve that and really even create sometimes a better human experience, even though you don't have anyone on staff. So Katie, I'd, I'd like to kind of hear from you as well um, on that human element piece. You know, how are you guys focusing on, on, on using the, the two, but still, you know, maintaining human element through automation? Um, well, so some of what we've tried to do is sort of inject some of the human element just into our regular customer communications of keeping those, you know, frequent, keeping customers updated of things that are going on at the property, um, you know, keeping those kind of personal. So it might be something as simple as, hey, we're having a keypad replaced at a gate. We're going to email all the customers, let them know, you know, between eight and four, the gate's going to be open. Uh, you know, we're going to have a repair tech on site and, you know, don't worry, it'll be, you know, repaired and fixed by, you know, five o'clock this afternoon. So you know, some of those things we can still do through automation and it still keeps the human touch, right? I mean, our our software puts in the customer's name, you know, puts in a closing greeting and all those things. Uh, but then on the flip side, the people who really do require like a human contact, uh, especially in situations where maybe they abandoned their storage rental, they made the reservation, they started the online rental process and they stopped for some reason. That's where we, you know, have our managers pick up the phone and call that person say, hey, was there an issue online? Is there something that we can do to help you, you know, convert this into an actual move-in? Do you want to visit the facility? You know, what was the reason that, that this didn't work? Uh, and that way we're just doing that little bit of follow-up to try to get those customers and to let them know like, hey, just because you can do it online doesn't mean you have to. You can still come in if you need to, um, or you can do that process or our manager can email you the same lease, you know? So there's, there's just that functionality that we're trying to put in where kind of meeting people the way they want to be met, so. Totally, makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so that brings up an interesting point. I think as I think about automation and as we've been exploring this, um, one of the things that's resonated with the people attending these webinars a lot is using automation and communications. Um, you know, you still want to have somebody behind those communications. So if they have questions or responses to that. But Brad, I'm curious, in your, your case, when you have unmanned, I suspect that you guys are also investing in automated communication strategies. Can you kind of walk us through how you guys handle that? Yeah, so we are beta testing several right now. Uh, Right now, they're website oriented uh, where we're working. Um, one of our biggest expenses is our call center. And so as much as I can do to unburden that call center, we, we continue to unburden our expenses. So there's some great AI chatbots out there now 
that you would think you're texting with a live call center agent, but in fact, you're, you're texting with a bot who's probably capable of handling about 80% of the FAQs that come up. So right now, the technology looks really promising. There's definitely a learning curve uh, to figure out what it can handle and what it needs to pass on. And then you, you know, have to have the support staff behind it to, to pick up those handoffs. But I'm excited for that. I think that that's going to be a big benefit for us next year. Yeah, that, that's really cool. We actually haven't spent a lot of time talking about chatbots, but those are becoming more and more popular, especially in the storage industry. I've noticed a lot of people adopting those. Um, Katie, I'm curious, what on your communication strategy piece, can you kind of give us some of the nuts and bolts of how you guys have implemented automation for, for communications? Yeah, um, so we have a text message service. You know, that's set up to be able to text somebody when they when they make a reservation. It sends out a text confirming the reservation, sends out a text the day before they're moving if they've scheduled it in the future. Just saying, you know, hey, as a reminder, our hours are this. We've got you set up for this unit at this price with this special. Look forward to seeing you. Um, so some of those just kind of reminder points that otherwise would be a customer phone call. Um, we also do have, you know, just on past due services. I mean, a lot of that is automated now as well, um, where, you know, automated text, automated phone call. Um, and that all kind of leads you to be able to make a payment easily. So it just, you know, funnels you where you don't have to go into the office. You don't have to mail your check in. It's just trying to push you through with no contact at all. Just, you know, be able to make that payment easily in a very efficient way. Um, so that's that's a lot of the ways that we're using things right now. Um, now, we do currently have a chat service on our website. Um, and we're always working to improve that. So I think that's something that we'll see further development on for us, um, especially through the first quarter of 2021. Because I am, you know, very interested in some of the AI chatbots. I've seen the, I mean, just leaps and bounds increases in their ability to serve customers in a really, you know, organic seeming way. It doesn't seem like a robot. So. Very good. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, one, uh, I want to go back to this concept of practical automation. And uh, just kind of as a reminder for those folks that maybe didn't get to, to attend the webinar um, two weeks ago. Again, it's just this concept that, you know, you don't have to be entirely automated or you don't have to be not automated at all. But the reality is you're probably taking baby steps and that makes sense for you and your portfolio. Um, and, and also just kind of the scale, how many facilities you have and, and the investment of time to implement it. And so one thing I wanted to do with, with both of you guys being pretty heavily invested in automation, Brad obviously being you know very heavily uh, invested. I'm hoping you guys can give a little bit of advice to those folks that are maybe looking to dip their toes in for the first time and just talk about if you were to only be able to invest in one or two pieces of automation, what would be the first things you'd prioritize? Where do you think that you get the most value for your business out of those items? Uh, um, Brad, sorry, Katie, go ahead. No, it's okay. Uh, so for my side, I mean, I think that text messaging is one of those things you have to be able to do right now. I mean, it, it's it's the way that, you know, 90% of us just look at things, you're right? Everybody's on their phone, everybody's got a phone in their pocket. And so if you're unable to communicate with your customers via text, you're really missing a huge opportunity of being able to reach those people the way they're used to, you know, to talking to other people now um, or other companies. So I think text messaging is, I mean, essential. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, when you look at softwares, you look at, you know, different things to just manage your business, make sure that it has these pieces, even if you don't know how to use them right now, the fact that it has them, you know, you can get comfortable with the software and then take a little step, you know, baby steps at a time until you're taking advantage of all the automation that your software provides. Very good. Yeah. How about you? From my perspective, you know, I'd, I'd recommend one of the uh, lowest hanging fruit out there is the online move-in process. Um, you know, all the components are storable between Sparefoot uh, through the marketing website now and through storage and site link. Uh, all that's a well-worn process. Uh, all the bugs are worked out. I mean, the, the services work great. Uh, Storable's done a great job with that. And and the reason it's so important is it's it doesn't just give you the after hours. It's not like you're just only picking up the move-in 6 to 10 p.m. that maybe your competitors can't. It's the convenience factor that you're able to advertise if you have an online marketing campaign that you are online move in capable. And so, you know, if you're somebody, uh, you know, working at a desk during the day and you know you need a storage unit for that weekend, uh, you're going to gravitate towards leasing units from those storage properties that can offer you that online move in rental process rather than having to find the time to get down there during business hours to, to go in an office. And just to quantify what the effect was for us, we got 
going, we bought, our first facility we ever bought was manned and we kept it manned for an entire year. And over the, the first, those 12 months that we owned it, the best, the most move-ins that facility had in a single month was 35. The very first month we turned on online move-ins, we had 48 move-ins. So it can have a really profound effect. Yeah, that's yeah, a great story. Go ahead, Katie. I, I would agree with that. I mean, the second we turned on online move-ins, we saw our conversion rates for, you know, leads to actual rentals. I mean, increase just, you know, 15, 20% for some sites. I mean, it's been amazing. Um, now, depending on, you know, the technological capabilities of the areas that you operate in, some sites don't have as dramatic of an increase, but the ones that do, it's it's a, just a no-brainer for something you do have to embrace. Yeah, and, and I think it, it, a, a good transition to talking about the health crisis in general, right? Because <laughs> I would say probably on the concept of online move-ins, a lot of people have kind of been forced to move into that space um, as a result of this, just out of necessity, whether they are closing their offices or they're sending people off, you know, maybe they're, they're keeping them in, but they're keeping their offices locked. We've kind of heard things all across the spectrum. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of curious, is, is this something that you guys think is kind of a, a permanent change? Do you think customers are going to start expecting this online experience more, these digital forms of engagement? Or do you think this is more of kind of a trend and a necessity just based on what we're dealing with right now? And so Brad, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, I think the way I'd articulate it is that I think COVID has accelerated the adoption of and, and people's comfort with kiosks and online transactions. Uh, I think I can actually quantify that for what it's meant for us looking at our call center. So uh, we, on January, the month of January, we had 0.3 billing calls per occupied unit that we had. So 30% of all of our customers called our call center to make their payment. I just looked at the numbers for September and that was down to 0.17. So we went from 0.3, 30% of our customers to 17% of our customers calling that call center to make that payment. So and we didn't see a big drop off in payments. So that wasn't what happened. So those people substitute away from our call center to our website and to our kiosks to make those payments. And that's, that's wonderful for us. I and mean, that's a big savings on our part, but I think it really reflects that COVID has, has forced people to embrace or at least accept that that's a, a method. And once they get used to it, I think they, they actually prefer it. What about you? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that that a lot of these changes are permanent. It, you know, it forced us to adopt these things that otherwise would have been a longer process. You know, for Move It, we always had online rentals as a goal. Um, but we were, you know, we went from having three or four test sites in February to let's turn it on everywhere by the end of March. I mean, it was just, we need to have it on, we need to be able to transact. Um, so, you know, for us, now that we've done that, I can't imagine ever saying, you know, we're gonna turn that off, we're gonna go back to the way it was. Uh, because it's been just so effective for our business and people have enjoyed transacting that way. And maybe they still, you know, maybe they still call us after they've done the rental, just like, hey, just wanna check in and make sure this worked, you know, I know where my unit is, whatever, but, I think that customers like being able to pick out their unit, you know, make the the rental, you know, choose anything they need and just go through with it because they're used to that self-service aspect from online shopping, from Amazon, from Walmart, from whoever, you know, grocery delivery. I mean, all these things, people have now embraced that as a time-saving uh, method just to, you know, conduct their day-to-day -day business. Yeah, and, and I think, Brad, what you mentioned earlier, where it's, I, I think a common misconception, at least pre-health crisis, was that you were essentially just gaining customers who would have shopped overnight, right? People that were not there during the business hours. But I, I do think that it is a, a recurring theme we continue to hear from people is these, this, these are incremental leads. This is not just a different type of lead you're capturing, but especially as people are forced into this adoption, and Katie, to your point, they're doing it in a million different ways, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, think about how many people are, you know, using Zoom to connect with their nieces and nephews, grandmother, whatever, that never yeah. even knew they existed seven months ago. And so um, I do think it's kind of an incremental. Katie, one thing uh, you mentioned in particular that I think is, is interesting is, to your point, you were kind of forced to uh, uh, make that migration to more of an online transaction for some of your stores. Um, what were some of the lessons that you guys had learned in forcing that? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people on the call that were also forced to do that. And so I'm curious if there's anything you can kind of share with them about, you know, ways they could do that a little better. 
Uh, so the biggest thing for us operationally was making sure that the inventory that we had available online was accurate and available to physically move into, uh, because we wanted to take the approach that if you rent it online, you should be able to access it, you know, immediately upon the start of your lease date. Uh, and so that for us was a little bit challenging of, you know, you have to have this whole conversation. Well, do you leave units unlocked? How do you secure units? What do you do about a lock? You know, what do you do about this? And so some of that was it, it's something that you just need to, to work through with your employees. Um, for us, we took the position that, you know, we were going to secure our units with just like a tag. Um, so you could, you know, break open that tag, access your units. So they're still, you know, sort of secured, but they're not locked. So they're all accessible still. Um, that so far has worked very well. Um, the other, you know, thing that we've run into operationally is, you know, for the most part, we all have newer gate systems at our facilities. The one or two that have older gate systems maybe have a hiccup on that gate code becoming active, or there's a secondary code to get into a climate control building or something like that. So those are all things you kind of need to work through and figure out, you know, for your own company of how do you handle this access challenge and just make sure that you're, you're preparing your customer for that because the worst thing to do is to say you're going to get immediate access for your unit and they don't. Um, so if there is some additional challenge like that, you know, maybe you do say the next business day, this will be active or within, you know, one hour of your reservation, someone will call and give you your personalized code, some other, you know, contact that way the customer knows exactly what to expect when they get on the site. Yeah, I love that. That that piece of education, both on the, the, the customer side, but also your internal team side and making sure that both understand kind of what the experience is going to be for one another um, ahead of time is a, is a thing we've talked a lot about on this automation because it is so important that if they, if you're not going to have a person talking to them during this process, that they have very clear understanding of what they're about to go through. And so, Brad, I kind of want to throw it to you. What are some of the lessons that you guys have learned on the educational piece and some of the corners maybe you're, someone dipping their toes into this wouldn't, you know, know to look around? Yeah, so um, the technology is very alluring. You know, you, you get the idea that you can just set this thing up to run like a bank ATM and never mess with it. Uh, and there's truth to the ability to do that. But what you, you're going to quickly learn is that if you do push through all the way to the point that the systems are automated, or at least people expect them to work without the manager there, even if it's after hours, is that technology does fail. And so we've defined a metric in our company, the instance of failure rate, and it's a metric that we track and we're always trying to drive to zero. And so there's a couple of things you can do for that. Um, you can have redundancy. So if you have the ability to have two gates, uh, you know, you've dramatically improved your chances that at least one gate will be working. Um, you know, internet, uh, you know, everybody's had, I'm sure a cable modem stop working and you call their customer support and they tell you to just plug it, unplug it and plug it back in. Well, if no one's there, it's hard to do. So we've created technologies and bought some technologies that can cycle power, for example, automatically to the internet modem. So you end up not only working towards redundancy in active and passive systems to keep your technology online, but also a business intelligence that you have to build around it. So we have sensors, for example, that alert us if a, a gate or a door has been open beyond a certain you know, 30 seconds or something like that. So we can be more reactive to it and not have to rely on our customers to be our to proxy as a business intelligence and tell us, hey, the gates you know stuck wide open. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, especially the power cycling. I mean, to your point, it's just something you wouldn't even have to think about how that would be a problem until you just got that in the wild, right? So yeah, you learned those the hard way. <laughs> that's fascinating. Well, um, guys, I have one more final question here uh, for you guys, which is. Another common misconception we hear, or at least I think it's a misconception, we'll hear from you guys in a moment if you agree, but um, is this concept that like going more heavily automated is only for people that have really large portfolios, right? Or the scale just kind of has to make sense. And, and I know there's some truth to the point where, you know, if you've got probably 20 units, uh, one facility, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to invest in everything. Um, but I'm kind of curious how you guys think about that as you talk to other people who are interested in, in deploying automation. Um, and whether or not that makes sense for large, small operators, you know, et cetera. So Katie, we'll, uh, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think that it actually makes more sense for small properties than it does for large properties uh, because small properties cannot afford a heavy expense load, especially from personnel. So if you have a facility that has, you know, 100 units and the average unit price is, you know, $100, that's not a lot of money monthly to pay for a full-time person 
you know, pay for any maintenance that needs to be done, pay for all these other things. So if you're able to cut out some of those employee hours with just automation, you know, maybe you're running the facility directly and you just have, you know, a, a contracted maintenance person who can go through once a week and, and just check on things for you. But, you know, you can handle a lot of these day-to-day -day things with just a good, you know, online-based software. Um, yes, you still need to check the property regularly, but I think I think this makes the most sense to invest in these technologies for small properties. And, you know, on the other side of that is it's less expensive if you were to try to invest in, uh, you know, some of the door locks or other things that, you know, some of the really high-tech stuff. I mean, just from a money perspective, doing that to 100 units is much cheaper than doing that to 600 units. So, you know, some of those things I think make so much more sense with small properties. You know, and let me add one other thing. The other thing that we don't always talk about is these annex facilities. Maybe you do have a main site and you have an annex that's five or six miles down the road. You know, automation allows you to run that annex, you know, pretty much remotely. I mean, you don't need that person on site. You, maybe you still have an employee check on it, but they're not there every day conducting business. So, you know, the small sites do have a great opportunity, I think, for automation. Yeah, uh, it, it, I'll tell you from experience, it's, it's harder actually to do automation at scale uh, than it is starting out. Um, at scale, you can't keep your finger on everything. Uh, it's really hard to make sure your quality uh, on site and everything's being maintained. Um, the great thing when you're when you're starting out with just a facility is, you know, what you need to do is, is really ask yourself, what is the person on site doing, right? They're answering questions for customers. Uh, they can really do that from anywhere. Uh, the online move-in really ties into your controlled access. That, that's a really easy one to solve. You know, there's great lock solutions out there for dealing with securing vacant units and overlocking units. Um, all the, that's the easiest part of it is, is, is implementing the technology that can do controlled access movement, um, move in, move out, and stuff like that. And then as long as you have a person to answer the phone, I don't want to underweight the importance, even with technology, the importance of somebody answering the phone. Even with our website and our kiosk, the last time we tallied the figures, 70% of all of our new movements still touched the call center at some point. So you have to have somebody answering the phones, but you can have one person answer the phone for a bunch of facilities. We average 0.25 people per facility through our call center. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I I love that human element. I appreciate you guys kind of continuing to bring it back. I know that a lot of people, again, just to reiterate, think that you have to sacrifice that to go more towards automation. But the reality is you're just bolstering that or making it more efficient, right? Uh, and Brad, in your case, right, one person can answer the phone for multiple facilities. There's no reason you can't still provide an excellent experience that way. So, Well, good. and the nice thing about pushing them through a call center rather than an in-person uh, contact is, you know, with COVID, with all these challenges, if you do have somebody who's exposed to COVID, who's an on-site manager, I mean, you're kind of stuck. Most of us are staffed so lean that you don't have somebody else to come in there. If you've got a call center set up, you know, one, they're not being exposed to customers and all the germs that customers bring face-to-face. -face. But then, you know, two, if somebody gets sick, it's easier to just reroute calls um, than to try to staff the office. My, my light just turned off, hang on. <laughs> it's on a sensor, I'll just leave it off. <laughs> no worries. Well, we're wrapping up anyway, so no big okay. deal. Um, I did want to just say uh, thank you guys, though. We, I, I really appreciate you guys joining us today. Appreciate you lending your insights and all. Um, we're not going to have time for Q&A. We are right at 11 or 12.30 Eastern. I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So uh, what we'll do is we had, did have a couple questions come in. And so I will follow up with Brad and Katie myself and get you guys some answers to your questions based off of what we discussed today. Uh, but again, Brad, Katie, thank you guys so much for joining. We really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you for, for having us. Yeah. So before I let everybody go real quick, I just wanted to remind you um, is in next, uh, in two weeks actually, we're gonna be opening the last chapter of our webinar series and it's gonna be on this conversation on amplifying your operating revenue. Uh, and so in particular, we're gonna discuss how you can kind of utilize revenue management plus some ancillary revenue streams uh, to kind of make up for the offsets and tenant demand that we've seen throughout the health crisis or at least the spikes in that. So be on the lookout for an email from the Storable team uh, on that webinar next week. But that concludes today's webinar. So if you guys do have any questions that come up, like I said, I'll follow up with the people that already submitted them. But you might have something that comes up over the weekend or next week.
feel free to send us an email at webinars at storable.com uh, and we'll chase down an answer for you. So other than that, I uh, hope you guys have a great weekend. Stay healthy, stay safe, and take care. Get the power to do more with storable websites, more marketing, more engagement, more customers moving into your facility. Storable helps operators do more with the most powerful technology in self-storage. Learn more at storable.com slash do more.